We're happy you're here this morning. Let's all stand. We're going to get ready to sing. We have Kids Church in the sanctuary this morning. We are happy to have the kids with us. Hopefully, as long as the computers keep working, they're going to show us some of their sweet dance moves this morning. So we are, uh, we're excited to sing and dance with them this morning. Turns out they're the ones you've been looking for. 
for all this time Cause I'm just a nobody Trying to tell everybody All about somebody To save my soul Ever since you rescued me You gave my heart a song to sing Waiting for the world to see Nobody but you About a rock, she was so fine. Two feet, twelve outsiders, nobody would have chosen in the change the world. Well, the moral of the story is everybody's got a purpose. So when I hear that devil start talking to me, say, Who do you think you are? I say, I'm just a nobody trying to tell. videos of the worship songs that we, we sing over here with kind of some motions to them to kind of help them remember the words. So they are really excited to do this next video with you. We're going to sing Raise a Hallelujah. If you guys are feeling up to it, feel free to do the motions with them. We're just excited to uh, sing and dance with them this morning. Good to see you guys this morning. You know, be seated and get religious, take smiles off your face. It's time to get serious, serious religious stuff. You know, I've been talking to you the last couple of weeks about purpose and about mission. God Himself has put a desire, He's wired it into our DNA. He has put a desire for mission, for purpose, to be a part of something bigger. Really, that is evidence of the love of Christ that's within us. And every believer also, at some time or another, struggles with the question of, how do I find my purpose? And how do I fulfill my purpose? Our reading today kind of gives us some insight into both of those, answers to both of those questions. And I was also reading from Acts chapter six, verses one through four. And it says that in those days, 
When the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. So brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Now, you know, the first thing I told you a while back, a couple weeks ago, that if you want to find your purpose, if you want to find your mission, if you want to find something that Jesus is equipping and calling you to do, the first thing and the single most important thing is to get connected to team. That's right. Um, and when you get connected to the team, you don't find the mission. The mission comes knocking. The mission finds you, and that's exactly what happens here. God is using a mini crisis of sorts to bring about together something that's going to launch his ministry. Now, mini crises. I just, I, I, I've only got a couple more stories about the special kids and the special band and the special school. I'm alive. Remember last week I told you the kid looked at me and said, Mr. Huff, I'm going to have to kill you. <laughs> Chucky said that. Well, <clears throat> I remember when I met Chucky, it was, it was on a van ride last year, actually. And um, I can't see my wife. I'm sure she's giving me some kind of signals right now. Don't tell that one. Don't tell that one, buddy. Here we go. <laughs> just, it was just a little minor thing. One of the third graders in the back picked the booger out of her nose. And then she put the thing in her mouth. Now that's just a minor thing, except Chucky was there. And Chucky has this laser radar, so zoop, he sees it. And then he gets, he can't let it go. And, and I just, they had just got on my van, so I know that I'm gonna hear stuff for the next 30 minutes, and, and, and Chucky is my, you know, we all have gifts, right? His gift was swearing. Now, I can't use the language that he obviously used, but you'll get the idea. He says, oh my blankety blank, she picked a blankety blank booger out of her blankety blank nose and put the blankety blank thing in her mouth. What kind of blankety blank blank takes a blankety blank booger and puts that blankety blank thing in her mouth? On and on and on. You know, I handle it very professionally, you know. Okay? I'll tell you what the blankety blank thoughts go into my mind was. I like to stop this blankety blank band, and I like to blank this blankety blank little kid out of here, and I put him in I tell him some blankety blank places where I'm going to put some blankety blanks. But I didn't do that. Uh, they gave us extensive, you know, before I go to the special school, the special needs, and the special, they gave us extensive. It's really expensive training. I think it lasted an hour. So, so here's how I'm dealing with this. I'm driving this van. We're going, you know, 55 miles an hour on, on Route 123 up here. And all of a sudden, this little third grader, because she's getting swore out, she starts crying. And now, okay, so she starts crying. And now the other kids who are a little older, they get upset because there's all this noise going on. And man, that van, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I'm thinking about all the stuff I had, you know, my hour training, and I really couldn't find anything. And, <laughs> and so finally I knew. I knew I had one, I had one choice. I said, I said, Chucky, I'll tell your bad mother. And he's oh. Because she takes his video games away. And I don't want to tell grandmother because if he spends the whole day without video games, I'm the first one to pick him up in the morning. He, I mean, there have been times that she, I, I promise you, there have been times that she took the video game away and the sheriff was there the next morning. And he's running out without his clothes on. And it's crazy stuff. <clears throat> so I said, I said, you have to apologize. I'm going to have to apologize. He goes, okay, Mr. Huff. He says, okay, Maddie. I'm sorry that you're a blankety blank blank and you pick blankety blank boogers out of your blankety blank nose and stick those blankety blank things in your mouth. <laughs> she says, 
I don't think he really meant it. <laughs> no, I don't think he did. Oh. <clears throat> All right, so here's, a, here's this crisis unfolding, this mini crisis unfolding in, um, in the church. And sometimes we think that there's something mysterious or something ultra spiritual about getting involved. Maybe if I'm going to get involved in God's mission, maybe there should be a little bit more of a dramatic sign. Maybe, maybe, you know, I should get a visit from an archangel, you know, visitation of the Virgin Mary, a couple signs in the heavens, and maybe a Zoom call with Jesus. But then none of that happened. They found their purpose through a need in the church. That's how God directed them. A little, a little, a simple, a simple need. Something like that seems unspiritual. Something like that seems like common. Something like that seems insignificant. Something like that means, you know, what did I tell you? And you have to know this. There are no unspiritual callings. There are no insignificant callings. There are no minor callings. Where you are, what he's called you to do, that matters. That means something. That's important. That's how the body grows. It's a team effort. We are working on this together. And every single one of us have our place, and we have our mission, and we have our job to do. This is what it says in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 10 31. It says, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And he says, and whatever you say as representatives of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And then he says, for put your heart and soul into every activity that you do as though you were doing it for the Lord himself. Because that's exactly what we're called to do. The home that you're at, that is your mission field. The place where you work, that is your mission field. The community where you live, the church you attend, the places you go, that is where he's placed you. And that is part of your mission. And it's not minor and it's not insignificant. It matters. But I want to point out something else. That even in this rather minor, rather kind of simple, uh, common activity, waiting on tables, didn't seem all that glorious. The disciples give us a little insight to who they are. Oh, I'll drop that guy. <clears throat> it says, notice what they said. In the rather insignificant and minor thing, they made it really clear that they wanted believers who were full of the spirit and wisdom. See, here's the connection, what you gotta get. Here's something they understood that sometimes we forget. That if you want to find your mission, you get connected to the team. But if you want to fulfill your mission, you have to get connected to the Holy Spirit. That's the truth. They understood that. This reading kind of insights the great value that they place. We need people. And why is that? Why was that so important? Because, listen, in the modern church world, we have kind of learned how to operate without the leading of the Holy Spirit and the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the working of the Holy Spirit. Um, it was Billy Graham who once said, that if the Holy Spirit was removed from the church, 95% of its activities would be unaffected. Wow. See, we come to this place where we kind of operate church like a business, where we measure success not by lives changed, but we measure them by property acquisition and bottom line. And instead of you know evangelism, we kind of turn to marketing techniques and branding. And instead of preaching the word of God, we've kind of settled for, you know, kind of nice, feel good, pop, you know, pop psychology. See, the mission that's ahead of us, what God wants us to do is impossible. It can't be done just solely through human means or through human efforts or through human activities. It can't be accomplished through just like, you know, business techniques. It can't be accomplished except through people who are filled with, who learn how to respond to, who learn how to listen to, learn how to obey, and learn how to yield to the Holy Spirit. Now, so, so sometimes, <clears throat> 
we, um, I hope, I just hope, I hope that we're starting to realize and how impossible our mission is. You know, it's the love of Christ who leads us and who leads us to the hurting, who leads us to the addicted, who leads us to the incarcerated, who leads us to the broke, who leads us to the lonely, who leads us to those places. The love of Christ leads us there. But it is the work of the Holy Spirit that breaks chains. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that opens eyes. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that brings grace. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that brings his change. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that conquers evil. And you and I have an opportunity right here and right now to be people who are filled with, walking by, led by, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. God uses everyday, common, ordinary people who are filled with his spirit to bring his change into this world. And we have to have that, and we can. So let me just kind of give, because, you know, sometimes we think, uh, you know, something like that is for the super spiritual, something like that is for the ultra-religious, but that is not really the case. Okay, so let me, let me show you how this works. You, let me tell you this, you were made, you were created to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible talks about how you're created. You're a created body, soul, and spirit. You are a tripod in your nature. Now, your body or your flesh is your connection to the material world. It's how you feel, it's how you see, it's how you respond to the outside world. And the flesh, what the Bible talks about, or the body, is governed by three impulses. It's dominated, there's really only three. It's a impulse to reproduce, it's an impulse to replenish, and it's an impulse to security. So when you watch National Geographic or you watch Shark Week or any of that stuff that you watch, all those animals are only motivated by three things. Everything that they do is connected to one of those three things. It's reproduction, it's replenishment, or it's security. So I hate to tell you this. Your cat doesn't love you. Sorry. I say all that for that. that. I really mean that there, there's a reason we have to understand. Now your soul is no different. Your soul is your connection to who you are and your personality. So your soul is governed by three other impulses. It's governed by your emotions, your feelings. That's in your soul. Your intellect is in your soul. And your chooser is in your soul. Your will is in your soul. You have a choice. Now, what we don't understand is what's happening in our spirit. See, when, when you became a believer and when you received Christ as your life, into your life, the Holy Spirit came into your human spirit. Okay? That's where he came. He dwells in your human spirit. You have a human spirit, and it connects to God. And there's three things, that, three words that kind of describe the work of our human spirit and the Holy Spirit's connection. One is communion. It's a place of intimate contact. It's a place of intimate. Do you realize that when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, you are connected to the very God? Jesus described... And it caused a lot of consternation and it caused a lot of trouble for his life. He described his relationship with the Father as, I and the Father are one. He didn't say we're close, we're very close. He said, man, we're close and close. No, he says, we are one. Wow. And you know, you want to hear one of the most amazing verses in the entire Bible. Maybe you don't, maybe you don't quite get this. Maybe I just think about this. This is in John chapter 17. This is where Jesus is praying. He's praying his last prayer before he, being, before he knows he's getting ready to go across. So this is his most important prayer. This is the thing that he wants most to pray. He says this. That they may be one. Father, as you are in me, and that I am in you, may they be one in us. 
that the world may believe that you sent me. That's John 17, 21. May they be one. Now, you may not feel it. You may not sense it. You may not always, but I'm you are one with the Father. You are one with Jesus, and you are one with the Holy Spirit. You have this amazing capacity to hear him. You have this amazing capacity to be close. And sometimes we don't use it, and sometimes we don't, you know, sometimes we disregard it, sometimes we let it go, but it's there. You are one right now with him. The second thing about the Spirit is it's intuitive. Intuitive means something you know without being taught. Something that doesn't require reason. Well, all of God's knowledge is intuitive. Nobody taught him. He knows. He didn't have to be taught. Every so when God speaks and when he tries when he's teaching us something, it always it always carries this intuitive type uh, context. Now, for instance, when I was when I first became a believer, I remember. You know, I gave my life to Christ and. You know, I didn't understand all of it. And, and if somebody, and, 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 and you know, I just sensed, I just knew he came into my life. So, you know, somebody could say, hey, can you explain that? No. Can you give me chapter and verse as to why you believe, you, why you believe, or why you're a believer, and why you think that Christ is in your life, and why he, could you, I couldn't. But I knew it. I knew it. You know, there's something about when I hear the truth, when I hear the truth spoken, when I hear the truth proclaimed, when I hear the truth taught, when I heard the truth, something inside of me goes, yes, that's it. I know that. I know that. So there's this intuitive thing. That's how he teaches us. It's intuitive in nature. And finally, uh, the Holy Spirit is a conscious. He is our governor of right and wrong. Okay? So, so here's what's happening as a believer, as a person. You've got your soul, you've got your emotions, and you've got your loves, and you've got your intellect, and you've got your flesh over here, and you've got your spirit over here, and all these forces are pulling on you all the time. You're getting these impulses from the intellect, from your emotions, and from your, and, you know, from your flesh, and all those things, it's always happening. You're in a constant battle. Here's how it's described with, uh, in uh, Galatians 5.18. See, it says this. Let me emphasize this. As you yield to the dynamic life and power of the Holy Spirit, you will abandon the cravings of your self-life. When your self-life craves, craves the things that offend the Holy Spirit, you will hinder him from living free within you. And the Holy Spirit's intense cravings hinders your self-life from dominating you. So there are two incompatible and conflicting forces within you your self-life of the flesh of new creation life of the Holy Spirit but when you yield to the Spirit you will no longer be living under the law but soaring above it now there's so much to unpack right there but here's what's happening man listen see we think being filled with the Spirit means like IGA I get more you don't get more he can't give you more. You know why? He's already given you everything. So being filled with the Spirit is not about getting more Spirit. It's about giving more of yourself to the Spirit. It's a matter of surrender. It's a matter of yielding. It's a matter of surrendering in faith to those to that leading of the Holy Spirit. And so here's what you have to understand. He says there's two forces here. That are incompatible. It says you can't be selfish and be filled with the Spirit. You can't be self-absorbed. You can't be self-controlled. You can't be self-dominated. You can't be self-promoted. The thing that gets in the way, the thing that hinders us, the thing that hinders the free life of the Holy Spirit within you is yourself. That's it. Self. We're our worst own worst enemy. But there's hope. I wouldn't leave you like that. Okay? Gosh, come on. Don't. Oh, no. And it, sound, and it sounds like an almost impossible thing, but it's not impossible. Look at this. Now, this comes from Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And I love this because it comes from the, the Passion Translation. And look, here's what it says. It says, oh, look, 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 look at me. 
Oh, she see that pastor? When you yield to the life of the Spirit, you will no longer be living under the law, but soaring. I just want to see that. We need to go soaring. Man, you, know, you know, I told you last week, Jesus can't make me a butterfly. I can't be a butterfly for Jesus. I can't flip. But I don't know how he's going to get me to soar. Maybe, you know, if, if I'm going to be a, you know, an instrument that soars, I'll probably be like a spiritual albatross. I'm going to need like a long, long runway. Lots of flapping. And you better watch out when I start coming down. Whoa! <laughs> so I'll be, I'll be soaring like an albatross, but I'll be soaring. So how does that happen? How do I get my tank filled with the Spirit? How do I get to this place where I'm yielded to Him? How do I get to this? How do I get there? Well, I'll show you. Please help you. You want to get your tank filled? You want to soar? All right, here we go. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It says, But the fruit produced by the Holy Spirit within you is divine life and all of its varied expressions. Joy that overflows. Peace that subdues. Patience that endures. Kindness in action. A life full of virtue. Faith that prevails. Gentleness of heart and strength of spirit. Now here's what you what we sometimes Here's what we need to understand about this passage. The fruit of the Spirit is singular. It's love. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Every other thing he mentions there are expressions of and actions. Of, not just abstract kind of, but they're connected to actions. So there really is a hint in here about how to soar. One, we have to understand the love of Christ has been placed in us, and he says, joy, joy that overflows. How do you get joy that overflows in your mind? How do you get your tank filled with joy? Well, it's a decision. You have to choose to rejoice in the Lord. Sometimes, sometimes, you know, you know, life starts weighing us down and flesh starts laying heavy on our lives. And, and, and sometimes, we, you know, we feel that just crush of, of depression. And, of, and, and, you know, back when I was like, back in London, Kentucky, where, back in the harbor, we had a pump. And, you know, one of those pumps. And, and we understood something. There was a vast reservoir of water, life-giving, life-fulfilling water underneath there. But you had to prime the pump. You had to put a little action into it. You had to put a little work into it. Sometimes, sometimes being filled with the Spirit is just like priming that pump. We actually used to have like they have like a little bucket, a little you know you have to pull the so you could prime that pump, and then the water started flowing. That's why the scripture says, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. Sometimes, you know, I don't know how you do it, but I know at night, I'll take my, take my headphones on my back porch, and it starts weighing down. I'll play like a little Psalm 34 from the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. It says, glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. And all of a sudden I get my mind off of all of my stuff. And I get my mind off all of my struggles and I start saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you that you have this under your hand. Thank you that I am with you right now. I start feeling a little joy. I start feeling a little joy right now. Kind of bubbling up a little bit. That's pretty good. Oh, you know, y'all, you know, y'all dance like those kids dance. Sometimes you gotta get your joy flowing. Secondly, he says, get grounded in peace. I mean, you know this. Our flesh dominates us with worry, with panic, with fear. Peace is a oh, tough. We need peace. You know, he says. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be known unto God, and the peace of God which passes understanding will fill. See, what you have to do to get grounded in peace, sometimes it's just a matter you have to reject thoughts. 
Sometimes you just have to reject the fears. Sometimes you just have to brush them away like an old black cat. They'll keep coming back, but you need to brush them. And you need to focus your thoughts and focus your mind on the God who is with you, the God who loves you, the God who is there right now, the God who has this in his hands. Amen. Be filled with peace. Peace starts flowing. Thirdly, he says, it's a patiently endured. The enemy says, give up. You can't do this. This is too big for you. This is out of your league. You're not good enough. The enemy's a liar. And what God says to do is endure. He says, be patient. Look, this verse comes from James chapter 5, verse 11. He says, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Here's why you endure. Here's why you hang on. Here's why you keep believing. Because the Lord has the end of your story in his hand. No matter how bad your story looks right now, no matter how hopeless it looks right now, no matter how bleak it looks right now, God has the ending in his hands. Amen. <laughs> kindness in action. You know what kindness does? See, you want to get your tank filled? Start being kind to people. Give away stuff. Be extravagant. Love them. You know what happens when you give away kindness? You make them feel. They feel the love of Christ. They sense, they see how real it is because you're taking the kindness that he gave to you and you're sharing it. That's powerful. There are people that I, every one of us are here because somehow kindness has touched us. Full of virtue. The enemy says, Oh, nobody will see that. You don't have to do that. You don't have to. That's just a little sin. No. We do the right thing. We do the right thing because he's called us. And here's what he says it says, According to the divine power given within us, all things that pertain to him, according as his divine power. Let me see that. Let me say something. His divine power has given you all things that pertain to godliness through the knowledge of him who has called you to glory and virtue. Glory means that God shows off. God shows off. He shows his love. He shows his character. He shows who he is through people who respond to virtue. Who say, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to do the right thing when it hurts. I'm going to do the right thing when it costs me. I'm going to do the right thing regardless of who's looking or who's not looking. I've chosen because he's called me to be good. He's called me to be virtuous. He's called me to do that. And, he's going to, and he's, his divine power follows that. In fact, his divine power follows all of these things. It's faith that prevails. You say, oh, no, this is too big. God doesn't listen to me. That's what the scripture says. For everyone, everyone who is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. God says, keep believing. Keep trusting. Purposely trust. Choose to trust. Decide to trust. It says, what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel, who through faith subdued kingdoms who worked righteousness, who obtained promises, who stopped the mouths of lions, who quenched the violence of the sword, who escaped the violence of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, and turned to flight the armies of aliens. Men who just, just like you and me, who had the same fears that we have, who had the same struggles that we have, decided to yield to faith, choosing faith. gentleness of heart. And I'll just read this from Galatians. It says, but we were a gentle among you as a nurse cherishes the her children. It's King James cherishes her. Gentleness, when you're gentle with people, you bring a healing. You become a healer. Listen. The bottom line is we're strong in spirit. That means we're choosing to follow the leading of the spirit. Here's what Jesus said. John 7, 38. This is what you've got to get. Look. See this. Believe in me. Trust in me. When he says you're filled with the Spirit, my Spirit lives within you, believe him. When he says resurrection life is within you, believe him. 
When he says love, his love is within you, believe it. When he says his joy is within you, believe it. When he says he is all of his character, when he's with you, believe him. And he says, if you do this, rivers of living water will burst out from within you, flowing from your innermost being, just as the scripture has said. That's what's going to happen. It's going to break out. Come on, break out of here. Um, God wants to do something in our worlds. He does. He wants to accomplish something. He wants to bring glory. His grace, his realness, his, his freedom, his transformation. He wants to bring it. And God always does his work through Spirit-filled believers. And by spirit-filled believers, I mean spiritually yielded believers. Believers who have yielded to, who recognize the love, who take the step, step out and rest. Those believers. He does his work. There's three things. Look, I'm done. Almost. Thank you. There are three things that a spirit-filled believer can do that nobody else can. One, we can offer spirit-led prayers. We can say, Lord, lead me in prayer. And he will. There's nothing more powerful than praying his heart. Secondly, we can do spirit-led actions. Actions of kindness. Actions of grace. Actions of reaching out. Actions that are stepping beyond. Actions that take risks. Spirit-led actions. And finally, we can share spirit-led words. Words that bring hope. Words that bring encouragement. I'm just nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who saved my soul. And look, it, it's real. Now, you know, healing flows. Every, listen, every time you follow his leading, every time you obey him, every time his spirit is released. Grace is released. Every time. You may not see it all the time, but it's that. Now, you know, Here's the thing I like to do. A lot of times at this point of the sermon, I always end up with a story. But you know, I told you guys when I got hired here, I like to hear other people's stories. And one of these days, I want you to be up here sharing your story. You know why? Because it's good for you, it's good for us, and it conquers evil. It really does. I love to hear real people's story. And so I'm going to invite Tammy. She's going to come and share a little bit about her story, about how uh, regular people, were used by God to bring healing and grace into her life. Hello. I wasn't thinking you were going to give me a microphone. But... Hi. How are you all doing? My name is Tammy. And I am excited to tell you about how God has been using people, like Rick was saying, to bless me. Stepping out in kindness. Um, First of all, I just want to say I've been here for 21 years, and this church has blessed me, Brian and Susie, and um, a lot of you are part of this story. So, um, three years ago, this past Monday, I had a stroke. A serious, crazy, I never found out why stroke. And um, God works in beautiful ways. I was actually, this morning, that I had a stroke. I woke up early and I was reading a book. Now, let me tell you, I do not wake up early normally and I don't normally read. But because that happened, I was holding this book and my left hand kept not being able to hold the book up. And I was like, is my hand asleep? What's going on? And it kind of weirded me out. I really didn't think of the stroke at all. I got down on my knees and I prayed. And then I got up to go to the bathroom. And when I was walking to the bathroom, my left foot was kind of like, I don't know, dragging. And I sat down on the toilet and I went, left hand, left foot. Am I having a stroke? Then I ran back to bed and I grabbed my phone and I called my kids. Nobody answered. So I called 911. And um, within a couple minutes, they were there and I couldn't move. In 20 minutes, my speech was slurred. My left side of my body was not working. 
And um, thank goodness for paramedics. And my kids all showed up at the hospital. Missy was there, Brian showed up, they're praying over me. I think it kind of freaked everybody out. And um, thank goodness I got the TPA or whatever that medicine was called. And uh, so I want to tell you the specific act of kindness that, I mean, there's so many. First of all, I want my three kids to stand up and Michelle too. Come on. <laughs> this is Jordan, James, Sean, and Michelle. Yes. And they loved me through this. I know it was a little freaky. Okay, so that night in the hospital, I get the shakes. I, I just got these nervous shakes. And everybody was gone. I don't know why they made everybody leave, but... And I couldn't calm down, and I was shaky. And so I pushed my nurse call button, and the nurse came in and I said, I really got the shakes. Is there anything you can do to help me? And she said, we can't give you anything because they're monitoring me. And I was like, do you, and I had this idea in my mind. I'm like, if someone would just rub my feet, I could just calm down. And so I said, is, is there any way that you could rub my feet? It's kind of embarrassing. And she actually told me no. She said, I'm sorry, I have too many things to do. Okay. But I had remembered that there was a lady that popped in the door that we knew from Woodland, one of James's friends' mom, Karen Stevenson, had stopped him to say hi for a second. And so I asked that nurse, I said, could you find Karen Stevenson and see if she's around? And before I knew it, Karen Stevenson came in the door I said, Karen, I got the shakes. I just can't calm down. I said, is there any way you would mind rubbing my feet? And she did. And this calm came over me, and I just was able to sleep and relax. And as I look back on that, it's like she was just like an angel. She did what we were talking about today, that, that who, I'm sure she, she went to work that day. She wasn't gonna think that God was gonna use her to bless somebody in their dark night with a simple act of rubbing somebody's feet. And that was just one. Like the next morning I woke up and I was lying in bed and I was imagining myself Johnny Erickson. Have you ever read anything about her? She was stuck in bed after she was paralyzed and I thought, oh my gosh, I can't do this life. I'm an action go-getter person and I was depressed. I need a drink of water. <laughs> anyway. This PT, I know Terry's a PT. This PT comes in, probably didn't know that she was gonna change my life that day. They come in, get me out of my bed, get me in a chair, and I get this. They got me to brush my teeth. Simple act, we don't think about, right? That opened up this dark moment that I was in, and the light just flooded me, and I felt like, <gasps> there's going to be life after this. Bless your sweetheart. Acts of kindness. Thanks, baby. <laughs> that happened to me, too. <laughs> <laughs> so then I just want to tell you about the mirage after that. People started coming in to visit me, lifting my spirits up, bringing flowers, sending cards, neighbors, like this old man Lowell, he sh I saw his boots under the curtain. I'm like, who's that? It was this like 70 year old man. He brought me this little angel. People filled my, my refrigerator with food. People here visiting me, bringing me food. Um, this one neighbor down the street, Norm, he built a handrail up the left side of my stairs so I could go home because you know, only my right side worked. Steve cut the grass. Um, my kids came and visited me at the hospital, and this is kind of when, I mean, they probably didn't think it was any big deal. We pulled out some cards. You guys remember this. We were playing cards, and all of a sudden we were laughing, and I felt like my life's coming back. And then all of a sudden I got so excited, I just fell over sideways. <laughs> Do you remember that? Oh boy, they have fun laughing at me. But what I want to say is that a simple thing done in a simple act of kindness can make such a big impact in somebody else's moment of darkness. And I also, as I was reflecting about this, I 
This goes on both sides. If you're in that dark time, you feel like fear and hopelessness is your world, ask for some help. I also asked the guy in the, in the um, life squad, because I was a little freaking out. I'm like, can you pray for me? Guess what he told me? No. He goes, that's not my job requirement. But fortunately, I asked my neighbor Jill to come over, because I was home alone, and she came over, and I said, Jill, will you pray for me? And so I asked a lot, but then there was people that just stepped out in kindness that blew me away and loved me. And um, I don't know if there's anything else I wanted to say, but Bane, you can come on up. Um, we can't to take away, this is one of the biggest things I learned, we cannot take away the dark, hard time in someone else's life, can we? Nobody could take that away from me. I can't take away what you're going through, but we can transform it into an opportunity to, to let God show off. When I look back to my stroke, I just feel like I was carried. I was carried by the love and the kindness and the beauty of all the people around me. And does that not give God glory? Amen. Amen. And look at me today. <laughs> I am healthy, I'm alive, and boy, does it make you appreciate things in a new way when you go through a hard time, doesn't it? Amen. So glory to God. Amen.